Me and my PhD student were supposed to be using the telescopes on the mountain in La Palma this weekend, but the volcano on the island had other ideas. Our trip got cancelled, but we were still hoping to maybe get data remotely via the magic of the internet, but that didn't happen either. So to help cheer me up, I asked you over on Twitter and Instagram to send me your favourite space memes so we could do a meme review. It's not really a meme react this video because I've kind of seen them all as you sent them to me, but it's a meme review, you know, where we take funny things on the internet and ruin them by making them educational. All right, let's start with this one. So many of you sent me this one, and I know why, because it's got Baby Yoda in it, so <laughs> you knew I'd love it. Me watching a rocket launch for the first time, uh, me watching a rocket launch for the 367th time, uh, it never gets all right. I actually saw the space shuttle launch from a beach in Florida when I was just a teenager, you know, before I started university, and that had a massive impact on me. I remember just being in awe of just the scale of everything, and the noise as well was incredible. So yeah, rocket launches, they just never get old, do they? No matter how many times I see one and no matter how much of an everyday occurrence it's becoming because, you know, satellite tech and, and even just launching into space in general has moved away from government space and agencies like uh, the European Space Agency, ESA or NASA in, in the US as well. Like, and now we've got commercial companies doing it too. So it's, it, it just, it'll never get old. And I will still look like baby Yoda every time I watch one. <laughs> All right, the next one I do love, but I have some qualms with it, right? So astronomy, the science behind realizing your own insignificance. Yes, okay, I'll admit, when you're stargazing and you're staring up at the night sky and you can see how many stars there are and you th start thinking about how many stars there are out there and that you can't even see. And you know, the fact that you can see Andromeda is just this tiny fuzzy blob and you know that's over a hundred billion stars and you're seeing it as a tiny fuzzy blob you can feel very, very small and feel very insignificant. And also when I'm doing my research as well, right? And I'm, I'm measuring the masses of supermassive black holes and they're absolutely huge. They're, they're billions of times more massive than the sun. You can think, how insignificant am I? Just this tiny lump of a few kilograms wandering around this not so special planet around a not so special star in a not so special galaxy. But at the same time, when I stargaze and I look out into the vastness of space, I don't, I don't really feel insignificant. If anything, I feel hope, like anything is possible, that I could, I could be anything and do anything because look, out there there's just infinite possibilities. That's the emotion that I feel. So maybe next time you go stargazing, you know, have a, have a think on that rather than the fact that you're insignificant. Speaking of stargazing, this one I loved, and I don't think it really needs much explanation, but I got nine 20 minute subs of the Triffid Nebula. I got two hours of data of the Andromeda Galaxy. I stacked an hour of video of Jupiter. You guys are clear skies. <laughs> that is the life of an astronomer, at least in Britain anyway. It feels like I was on holiday the other week and I was so excited to see the skies up in the Lake District, you know, where there was barely any light pollution. And I think we had one night of clear skies and that was it. And it lasted probably for about an hour, say a, a night. It was probably about an hour of clear skies. I did manage to catch, you know, Jupiter and Saturn and, and the Milky Way stretching over our head with, with sort of Cygnus there as well. So that was really special, but it was an hour. It wasn't you know, two hours or anything like that. They got here of the Andromeda Galaxy. I wish I had that. The next one is less of a meme and more of a joke, but it just really made me chuckle, so I've left it in. Orion's belt is a big waste of space. Terrible joke. Only three stars. <laughs> so yeah, Orion's belt is a collection of three stars in the constellation of Orion. Orion is supposed to be a person, they're a hunter. And so yeah, Orion's belt, it's very self-explanatory. It's probably one of the most famous constellations in the northern sky, at least after the plow anyway. It seems to be one that most people recognize, but what I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize about the constellations in the night sky, right, is that they're actually nowhere near each other, right? We're seeing the stars in space as if they're on the inside of this like two-dimensional sort of sphere that surrounds the Earth and the sky is, is some sort of like interior of that sphere, right? But in essence, we're seeing what is 3D projected down to two dimensions. And so those stars are actually nowhere near each other in Orion's belt. They're actually separated by more than a thousand light years. And so to really highlight this, one year we had a big Oxford Physics open day in the department and I managed to recreate Orion in a, in a dark room with some clear, essentially Christmas 
ornaments, like baubles, that we put LEDs inside of. And we made the constellation by hanging these ornaments from the ceiling. So there was a specific place in the room where you stood that it would look like Orion. And that was like, this is the view from Earth. But if you move ever so slightly, you'll see it as if you were moving away from Earth and, and seeing the stars in the constellation Orion from a different vantage point. And when you did that, you could see the stars in the belt and even the stars in the entire constellation, right? They were absolutely nowhere near each other. We worked out that it was something like one of those classic office ceiling tiles was like 500 light year step. And that's how we did it. All right, the next one, the next one did make me laugh because it's a dig at 2020 and everyone likes making digs at the year 2020 now, but also it's completely and utterly ridiculous, right? 2020 has so many insane things going on that the Pentagon just confirmed that UFOs are real and it barely made the news. I mean, it really did make the news. My news feed was absolutely flooded with this and people asking questions about it. And it's just like, uh. <laughs> First of all, UFO just stands for unidentified flying object. Anything in the sky that you're not sure what it is comes under the header of unidentified flying object. If you're like, oh, that thing up there, it's so high up, I can't tell if it's a bird or a plane. That's an unidentified flying object to you. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are flying saucer aliens running around the atmosphere, right? An unidentified flying object is just something that we as humans can't necessarily tell what it is. And you know, there's probably a lot of those things. I think it would be very arrogant of us to assume that we knew everything about what goes on on planet Earth. We really don't. We're still very naive in that sense. Science has brought us a long way, but we still don't know everything. That's kind of why we're still doing science. That's the point of science is to figure out the answers to the questions that we still don't know. And there's a lot of those questions. A lot of those videos released by the Pentagon had a much simpler and let's face it, more believable explanation than alien spaceships flying around the atmosphere. You could put a lot of them down to essentially perspective on how you were seeing things. Yeah, okay, they looked funny shapes, but a lot of them were incredibly zoomed in and things can look like weird shapes from very strange distances as well and very strange angles. So no, I don't believe any of those videos that were released by the Pentagon were actually of flying saucer aliens. Do I believe that aliens exist and other life forms exist in our universe? Sure, I can't help but think they do when you consider the number of stars and planets and galaxies out there. We, we can't be alone. Do I believe they've made it to Earth though and they're flying around among us? No, unfortunately not. If we ever find signs of life, it's gonna probably be bacterial life in our own solar system, we hope. Anyway. Speaking of life in the solar system, the next meme is about just that. We got scientists distracted by life on Venus from life on Mars. And this was definitely what happened last year in 2020. So if you remember, there was an announcement that the molecule phosphine had been detected in the atmosphere of Venus on, on Earth. You know, one of the ways that phosphine is produced is by thermophilic bacteria that can survive really extreme conditions. It's also produced by industry and cows and farming and stuff as well. But probably not going on on the surface of Venus, is it? So because there was no other explanation that was known, there was no chemical process known or geological process known at the time, people got very excited that it could be produced by life. Not that the paper ever said that. It said it's probably an unknown geological process or an unknown chemical process. Oh, but by the way, it could also be this as well. Of course, that's what got everyone so excited and so distracted from the idea of life on Mars. Life on Mars has always been captivated people more, especially since we found out that Venus really had this inhospitable environment, right? Where you've had this runaway greenhouse gas effect that's heated up to higher temperatures than Mercury, right? It's further away from the sun than Mercury is, but it's hotter than Mercury because of its super thick atmosphere. Mars, on the other hand, looked a bit similar to Earth. It almost looked like a, a desert planet, right? And so people got excited that perhaps it could be similar to Earth and that there could be life on there. But now we know that the magnetic field that we have on Earth protects us from radiation from the sun. Mars didn't have that. And so its atmosphere has been stripped over the billions of years that it's been alive. And perhaps it might have had life in the past, but not anymore. Maybe. But that's what Perseverance is doing on the surface of Mars now. It's looking for evidence of past life, maybe current life, but it's much more likely that we'll find some fossilized life back from when Mars might have been more hospitable. 
But the idea of this detection of phosphine on Venus got everyone very excited. Now that detection was actually called into question by another group saying, actually, if you analyze the data this way, you, you don't get the same detection. And so this is why there's been a lot of new missions to Venus announced to try and confirm or deny this discovery of phosphine and try and figure out where it's coming from. Is it coming from maybe some geological activity? Venus is very active in terms of volcanoes. Or is it coming from some unknown chemistry? Or is it coming from this bacteria that can survive in very inhospitable conditions. A scientific mystery, you know? That's what gets everyone excited. Speaking of missions to different planets as well, I loved this one next that someone sent to me. It was waiting for missions to Uranus and Neptune. Be like, <laughs> you've got Bernie on inauguration day. And I, you know what? I'm still not tired of the Bernie Sanders memes from inauguration day. It's absolutely fab. And I think it really does summarize what people are feeling that work on Uranus and Neptune and the icy giants, you know, the icy worlds in the solar system. The last mission to actually visit them first was the Voyage missions back in the 70s and 80s, right? And we wouldn't even have these images that we have if it wasn't for the Voyager mission. There hasn't been anything that's gone back since then. You know, mostly that's because when the Voyager missions were launched, it was at a really um, special time sort of in the solar system where all of the outer planets seem to be in roughly the same direction, right? They weren't quite lined up, but they were in roughly the same direction, which meant that if you sent a probe across in that way, you could visit them all at the same time. Now, if you want to visit Uranus and Neptune, you'd have to decide which one, because they've moved around in their orbits and they're now separated by a, a huge distance. And so that's why, for example, the New Horizons probe on its way to Pluto a couple of years back didn't really visit Uranus and Neptune because they were in completely the wrong direction for which it was heading to go to Pluto. Why we've not got a mission to Uranus and Neptune, it's not for lack of trying. People have, you know, put in for missions many a time, but it's, it's to do with funding, right? There's only so much funding to go around. And instead, missions to, say, Jupiter's moons, like the JUICE mission, all these missions to Venus that have been planned have been funded instead because there's perhaps more incentive for different reasons, you know, for finding habitable worlds or something like that to go to those places rather than to go to Uranus and Neptune. So in terms of, like, what we don't know in the solar system, Uranus and Neptune are, uh, you know, complete mysteries to us. This next meme was great and it gets really niche humour, so I hope you guys enjoy it too. But it says, as a resist after defining every element apart from hydrogen and helium as a metal, you know, I'm, I'm something of a chemist myself. <laughs> it's really funny that, like, we do just have this sort of, like, astronomer's periodic table, which is just, like, hydrogen, helium, everything else is essentially supernova poop that we're going to call a metal. We talk about the metallicity of stars, which is essentially the ratio of, you know, all the heavier elements that are produced in sort of runaway nuclear fusion towards the end of a star's life before it goes supernova, all of those things, compared to hydrogen, essentially. And that is essentially what we call the metallicity. So even if you're measuring the amount of, say, carbon or oxygen or nitrogen, that still comes under metallicity. They're still determined metals by astrophysicists or astrochemists, as they like to call themselves as well, where they talk about, you know, the different molecules that form in the interstellar medium, right? The space between stars where you have these huge gas clouds as well. And you're having, you know, getting this formation of various different catalysts that can actually speed up the process of the, of the collapse of stars as well. It's, it's fascinating stuff, but it must drive chemists absolutely insane when we refer to stuff like carbon and silicon as, as metals, right? And it's not just astrophysicists that do this either, like atomic physicists and quantum physicists wind them up massively as well, because there's this long running joke that like, you can explain the entirety of chemistry with a single page of like quantum mechanics on the behavior of a hydrogen atom. I, th I just think that rivalry between physicists and chemists is just never going away. This next one is for anyone that's ever worked in academia or the, the sciences, or if you say you've done like a, a science project before or something like that, and you've had to dive into, you know, all the scientific papers and, and what people have found before, right? Like this is how I download papers, just like, you know, just bringing out absolutely like two ton of them versus how I read them, where you just don't <laughs> skim them a little bit, right? And that's what I'll find I'll do as well. If I have a research project that I'm working on, maybe I have a result that I need to understand, I will find as many research papers as I can that are about what's been done in the field before about that topic, right? And I'll download as many of them as I can and then I'll try and, you know, read and take in as much information. But to, I mean, to do that, there's, there's so many that you could read, there's so little time, right? So you have to really be very clever about how you manage your time. And so, yeah, okay, you might end up 
not skimming it as such, but you'll read the abstract, you'll maybe read the figure captions, you'll read the conclusions, and if you, you understand what they found, then great, you'll, you'll move on, you'll take notes, but then you'll move on to the next paper. If you don't understand the next one, you might dive into it a bit deeper, but you don't physically have time to read every single one in that excruciating detail that you would necessarily hope. You might read one or two in that way, but the rest of them you really have to sort of like you know, use the, the background knowledge and previous knowledge you have to, to understand them as much as you can in the time that you have so that then you can, you know, form a reasonable hypothesis about what you found and how it fits into everything that's been found before. And we say we're doing research, that's what that means. It means really diving in, feet first, head first, whatever you want to call it, into the academic literature and what's been found before and, and figuring out what it all means. And finally, our last meme, so many of you sent this to me and I think I know why and I think um, Gabby Duro on Twitter actually summed it up best and it really made me smile. She said, thank goodness for Dr. Becky because this is a lad who's interested in physics, skipping all of the steps, right? He's skipping calculus, differential equation, probability and statistics and he just wants to know how black holes work and essentially I hope I can sort of help you all lift over all of that stuff if you if you don't know it right that's why I started this channel was so that people who were curious about how the universe works and how black holes work could actually have a hope of maybe understanding what was going on without having all of that background knowledge of all of the maths or general relativity or how tensor equations work right and sometimes it is really difficult to make some of the YouTube videos that I want to make because I know that the concept I'm trying to get across it could just be two equations, right? Two two lines of maths for, for someone, you know, who has the same background knowledge as I do, say like a colleague. But for a YouTube video, it has to be 15 minutes of me talking and figuring out how many of these steps do I need to explain so that you would understand it. It's sort of the, the endless struggle of the science communicator, right? But I absolutely love it. It's fun being creative and figuring out what ways to do that. And, I, and I'm glad to know that it is recognized at least by Gabby on, on Twitter anyway, but I'm sure many of you have been grateful for that. And it just makes me very grateful that you're here supporting this channel and want to learn from me, you know, that I get to share all this knowledge with you. This is why, this is why I do it. And I absolutely love it. All right, that's enough space memes for this week, but you know what? I never get tired of seeing them. So if on your travels around the internet, you come across any more, send them to me over on social media, Twitter or Instagram, you know, distract me through my day. You know, you never know. I might be like stuck on some coding problem and, and you send me a space meme and it makes me chuckle for a little bit. And then I come back and I've got a fresh perspective and I solve my coding problem. You know, you never know. You could contribute to the advancement of scientific research by sending me a space meme. <laughs> Before I go, I just want to say a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that has a huge range of interactive courses on all different areas of science and maths that get you to learn by doing. Learning by doing is the way that I learn best, which is why I really enjoy Brilliant's courses. And if you've been here before, you've probably heard me wax lyrical about them, but recently they've upped the interactivity on their courses to a whole new level. So if you're thinking about brushing up perhaps on your maths, say on your calculus, so you don't skip some of these steps on that meme that we just saw, then check out some of Brilliant's courses on calculus and on other areas of maths that you need to understand a lot of these physics concepts and see if the interactivity helps you to engage with the topic and see if it helps you also to remember what you've learned as well. If that sounds like something you'd be up for and you want to support me and my channel, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y. The link is in the video description down below and you can sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now you lot go forth and learn something new.